And we're happy to welcome back to the studio Antonia Maioni. She is director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, normally in Montreal. And we're happy to have you in that chair in Toronto. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, Steve. We wanted you in here because while what's going on in Quebec is, of course, uh, major news in Quebec, I'm not sure that a lot of what's going on right now, all of the controversies, uh, the you know corruption alleged between the Quebec uh, construction industry and the Liberal Party has penetrated much of the rest of Canada. Mm -hmm. And it's not on the news every night here, quite frankly. So let me start by reading this out of McLean's and then you can help us understand this better. Here's from McLean's back in September. In the past two years, the government has lurched from one scandal to the next, from political financing to favoritism in the provincial daycare system, to the matter of Premier Jean Charest's own long undisclosed $75,000 stipend paid to him by his own party to corruption in the uh, construction industry. Charest has stymied repeated opposition calls for an investigation into the latter, prompting many to wonder whether the Liberals, who have long-standing ties to Quebec's construction companies, have something to hide. Okay, let's unpack this. How did the alleged relationship between the Quebec construction industry and Mr. Charest's party come to light in the first place? It's been uh, something that has been pushed uh, onto the front burner of the agenda in Quebec by the Parti Québécois and the ADQ. So the opposition in the National Assembly has been hounding uh, the Liberal government on the issue of alleged corruption for almost a year now. And uh, there is a sense that uh, there may be some untoward dealings in terms of how contracts are accorded or how uh, executives in the construction industry uh, put pressure on different parts of the party or the government to do things. Now, none of these have actually come to light, but the allegations are there and the, the demands from the opposition for an inquiry, so a formal inquiry into what's going on. While the, uh, the opposition has been pounding the government, obviously public opinion has al also been aroused, right? Mm -hmm. Has also been tuned in. There's always been sort of a suspicion, perhaps, that a party like an old party, like the Liberal Party, might have this. And so the, uh, the, th that all led to what is pretty much a perfect storm. Um, what made, I think, the, the, the sort of what tipped or the straw that broke the camel's back is the fact that one of Charest's former ministers, Marc Belmar, came out in May uh, suggesting that these were not just allegations, that there was in fact perhaps a grain of truth in them, and complaining about the kind of undue pressure that he suffered when he was Minister of Justice about the appointment of judges. Has his, have his remarks been discredited? Well, they were certainly, uh, they certainly made for front page news. No kidding. Um, and they certainly sort of added a lot of fuel to this fire that was already simmering. Uh, so much so that it became not only a question of the party, or, but a question of Charest personally, because some of these allegations that Marc Belmar uh, put forward involved Jean Charest. The fact that he had gone to Charest's office and Charest had sort of pretty much told him to uh, quote unquote play the game. Um, and Marc Belmar thought this was not the way he wanted to do politics. He was a bit of a maverick and loose cannon. He only lasted a year in that portfolio before he left politics. But this was his word coming out. This was his version of events coming out. Well, if he's a, a, a loose cannon and a maverick, do people discount what he has to say? Well, there's the rub. Actually, mm -hmm. people tended to believe what he said. Mm. Uh, even when uh, Jean Charest came out to not only deny the allegations, but to launch uh, a legal suit against him. Um, so the idea is that you had the sort of he said, he said uh, thing on the table, but Quebecers seem to be more inclined to believe the former Minister of Justice than Jean Charest. And part of the pressure on Charest led him to not, to decide not to have a commission of inquiry into the construction industry, but rather a commission into the nomination of judges. This is a serious thing when you're accusing uh, the Prime Minister or the government of doing something about judges, right? Because that's sort of one of the foundation blocks of democracy. No kidding. Well, there, there is a former Supreme Court judge, Michel Bastarache, who's looking into, he's, exactly. he's heading an inquiry right now, right, on this. Uh, construction industry business, corruption yes. in the construction industry. Now, so the, his no, his his uh, his inquiry is into uh, reports, the allegations uh, to do with the, the nomination of judges. He ran his inquiry this fall, and it was followed in Quebec like the Gomer inquiry, right? It was sort of like the the, the soap opera, the daily soap opera. Must see TV. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's writing the report, which is expected out at the end of the month. Everybody know what he's going to say? 
Well, not quite, mm -hmm. but it looks like he may not be apportioning blame in the way that the media would have liked to make mm -hmm. it sort of a, a real black and white kind of a case. Why do you think this has, I mean, okay, let's be, well, I was going to say let's be delicate about this, but, but we don't have to be delicate. McLean's Magazine had it splashed all over their cover. They think Quebec's the most uh, corrupt province in the whole country. So the notion that there's a bit of corruption in the construction industry and maybe in the, in the way that judges are selected, you wouldn't think would cause scandalous shockwaves across the province. Has it? Well, I think it's the, that shows the opposite of what the McLean's uh, cover said. I mean, it shows that Quebecers are scandalized, are deeply upset by these kinds of uh, allegations. They're deeply upset that there could be this kind of scandal in the construction industry. They're, they're deeply offended, I think, uh, to think that there may have been some kind of uh, untoward dealings in the nomination of judges. So I think what the reality shows is the opposite of what you could conclude from that uh, McLean's cover, which is that Quebecers are scandalized and they want to see something. They want to see these issues addressed. What do you think of that McLean's cover, incidentally? Uh, I actually thought it was, uh, the, the, the headline didn't match what was in the context or the content of the, uh, of the article because it's hard to sort of say Quebec is the most corrupt without having some kind of a baseline, right? So social scientists will tell you if you're going to compare, you better have some comparison to be able to do it. And the story was not quite as scandalous as the headline suggested. That's right. Okay. Uh, let's bring up these, no well, yeah, let's bring up these numbers here. How would Quebecers vote today mm -hmm. if there were an election held? Uh, last polls show the Parti Québécois at 41%, Monsieur Charest's Liberal Party at 25%, Action Démocratique at 16%, the ADQ, Quebec Solidaire at 12%, Parti Vert at 6%. Now, obviously, if you're the Premier and you see these numbers, you look like you're in pretty tough. This guy's been written off before, though, mm -hmm. and he's made history in that province, winning three times in a row. So, you want to write this guy off yet? <laughs> can't write Jean Charest off, but he is in a much more, much weaker position than he's ever been because now his personal integrity is at stake. Uh, so it's not only, you know, what his party is doing and what is happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis other parties, but it's really about him as a leader. It's about the trustworthiness of him as a leader. It's about the way people feel in terms of confidence uh, in Jean Charest. Jean Charest has a love-hate relationship with Quebecers. Uh, it goes up and it goes down. Uh, there seems to be something about him that Quebecers are just uneasy about. Uh, and so he has been able to come back. He has been able to make this remarkable third victory in a row, uh, which only Maurice Duplessis was able to do before him. But there is something, I think, inherently about Jean Charest that Quebecers question. What is it? It's hard to put one's finger on it, but there is, there has been suggested that it has something to do with his outsider status. Uh, outsider status meaning that he, in fact, built his career in Ottawa, not in Quebec City. Uh, and it's very difficult to move from Ottawa to Quebec City, and only a few politicians have been able to do that. And the second thing is that he's an outsider in terms of his, his party politics, right? He came from a progressive conservative party, A, that no longer exists, mm -hmm. and B, that really didn't have much of a, a, a grip after 1993 in Quebec. It is funny how the, the uh, you know, Quebec and English Canada really are two solitudes, because I, I suspect in English Canada, Charest is viewed quite, um, quite differently. You know, he's seen as, in some respects, the perfect Quebecer. He's perfect in both languages. Uh, he presents extremely well. Uh, he's, he, you know, he seems to be in, in, in command of his brief. And, and yet, you know, he's in deep trouble in his own province. It's true. And, and you know, when I think back to the referendum uh, era in the 1990s, the 1995 referendum, Jean Charest gave the best speech of that campaign. He roused the no forces when we were, they were really in the dumps the week before the, uh, the referendum. And, and in many ways, the, he was the federal Tory leader. He was the, the federal Tory leader yeah. without a party, practically. Yeah. Party of two, like a party restaurant. Party of two, two seats. And he was able to, I think, really command a lot of respect uh, and a lot of hope for a lot of Quebecers. Which you say does not necessarily exist anymore. It's not necessarily where Quebec is at in terms of how they think about what's important in the body politic. And with the sense of crisis past, He's got to get onto the job of governing, and his government has not been popular in doing that. We saw in British Columbia that when your caucus has had it with you, mm -hmm. out you go. They got rid of Premier Campbell, despite his electoral victories in the past. How safe is Jean Charest within his own party right now? Well, this is the difference. Uh, Jean Charest actually still has uh, the respect uh, of his caucus, for the most part, and there's no heir apparent. Hmm. So unlike in other situations, it's not like someone is champing at the bit. Uh, trying to replace him, and there doesn't look like there's anyone who could, at least in the short term, do so. 
So, I mean, for lack of, uh, of anything better, or faute de mieux, I don't know, his, his position is pretty safe in the, uh, in the party for now. But again, that could change, and uh, it remains to be seen what happens in the rest of the year once that report comes out and once we get a better understanding of what's going on. That poll also suggested that if an election were held today, the Parti Québécois would win a majority government. Is there a love-in for the PQ right now in Quebec? <sighs> The, the Parti Québécois has a lot of support, but I wouldn't call it a leaven. And the reason is that it's still a party that's divided. It's divided in its leadership. It's divided between its left and its center. Uh, it's a very hard party to manage. And Pauline Marois, for all of her uh, qualities as a leader, for all of her deep political background, uh, is not universally loved, either within her party or within, within the public as a whole. Why so. Not? Again, this is someone who comes from the old guard of the PQ. Uh, she has a, sort of an attitude that is not as perhaps welcoming and, and, and uh, affable as Quebec like their politicians, Quebecers like their politicians to be. And again, it's a party that has its own internal divisions about sovereignty, about when to do it, whether to do it, about the left, about the right, about the role of the state. The fact that we're talking about maybe a new party coming on the scene in Quebec, I think shows that the Parti Québécois is, there is no love in for the Parti Québécois. I'm going to get to that new party in a bit, but it is it fair to say that she may be too rich to connect with average people? Yeah, well, I mean, she is a woman who is very well off, um, and there are, that's what a lot of the pundits talk about, you know, her chateau here and there, and how she's really out of touch with the, the, common, the common person. I'm not quite so sure that that's how Quebecers view her or view her politics, but there is something that is... You know, the, the idea of, of her going into a bar and having a beer with you, it's just not coming to mind right now. <laughs> now, her party's going to have a leadership review in April, I guess. Mm -hmm. How secure is she on that day? She is secure if, uh, you know, si la tendance maintient, if everything, <laughs> if the trend continues and if everything else stays the same. Okay. Now, uh, we remember, actually, it was uh, this month, no, yeah, January 1983 in Winnipeg. And Joe Clark decided 66.9% wasn't good enough to mm -hmm. continue as federal conservative leader. What number does she need to keep her job? That's a very good question. Bernard Landry uh, kind of did the same kind of, uh, what is it, Harry Carry or <laughs> uh, suicide when uh, he also went into a leadership review and felt that he didn't have enough support. Um, and his figure was more in the low 70s, uh, but, uh, sorry, in the upper 70s. I think that she will survive unless there's something else out there on the horizon. Well, Funny you should mention that, because we're going to bring up a pie chart here, which may indicate what that is. Here's voter intentions. Michael, let's bring up this pie chart if we could. If you add this new force, let's call it what they call it, Force Québec, this is a léger poll taken back in October, and if there, if there were to be a new political party on the center-right in Quebec, and François Legault, the co-founder of Air Transat and a former PQ cabinet minister, is spearheading this move to create this new center party, Force Quebec would be in first place with 30%. There's the Parti Québécois in the top left with 27, Liberals at 25, and the rest uh, carving up the last bit of um, the electorate there. Can you explain how a party that doesn't really even exist yet is in first place in a poll? Well, I think the main message is that Quebecers are fed up with their politicians and with their parties, and so that there's not just a lack of confidence in the premier, but there's really a lack of confidence in, in governmental institutions, including their political party. So I think that poll, while it's interesting, has to be taken with a grain of salt. It's, about, it's, a, it's a poll about something that hasn't happened yet, uh, and I think the main message is that it's, a, it's you know, we're fed up. Uh, the fact that this Force Quebec is led by a former member of uh, the PQ is important because it's the kind of electoral or, excuse me, partisan uh, coalition that is looking for support among nationalists who are more to the center and to the right uh, than the Parti Québécois. So who are, that's interesting because I was just going to ask you where they find themselves mm -hmm. on the political continuum. If you think the liberals occupy sort of the big mushy middle, I think we, here anyway, we tend to think of the Parti Québécois as the Social Democratic Party in Quebec. ADQ is more over on the right. Mm -hmm. So where's the room for them? Well, it's because in Quebec there's not just one spectrum, right? It's not just about left-right politics. It's also about where you are on the divide between federalism and sovereignty. And so in that respect, that's where the Force Québec comes into play. Since the Parti Québécois is better known as a social democratic party, the idea is that there are lots of, or there are many, there could be many, nationalist voters who would rather 
who are more to the center, more to the right, who would rather see uh, another kind of way of thinking about the relationship between state and society, about the power of unions, about the role of business. Even though they're nationalists, they don't quite connect to the Liberal Party, which is seen more of a federalist place, particularly under the leadership of Jean Charest. So they are a greater threat to the PQ than they are to the governing Liberals, is that right? I think they're a threat to both of those parties because they'll be taking support from both kinds of spectrums, right? Both the left-right and the federalist uh, sovereignty divide. Now, political parties are successful at winning seats because they have, they've got organizations, mm -hmm. they've got people to go drop off leaflets, and they've got nominated candidates and all this kind of thing. Does this Fox Quebec have any of that yet? No, not yet. I mean, it's really not even a work in progress yet. It's just a conversation, which is mm -hmm. why it's so surprising to see this be the level of support for it. It's a conversation uh, that was going to be spearheaded by former uh, politicians such as Legault, such as Joseph Facal. Now it's basically a party of one. It's Francois Legault and the kind of people he can gather around uh, to share his vision. But it has no organization uh, and it has really no uh, sense of what it is yet. And I think that's why uh, it remains to be seen what happens in terms of whether it can still occupy that uh, interest of Quebecers, the idea of a protest vote from Quebecers, and also whether it has any legs. Is it a sovereignist party? I'm not sure. <laughs> if it's a, I don't think it's sure if it's a sovereignist party. This was the question that was asked of the ADQ all the time. Are you a sovereignist party or not? And I think that's part of the, the difficulty of where you fit in the, 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 chess, the political chessboard in Quebec. It is a party that has nationalist leanings, yes. Uh, but it's also a party that believes that there is more room for uh, business and that perhaps state intervention is going a bit too far in Quebec. Mm. You know, here in Ontario, we have had basically the same three parties with seats in the legislature uh, since World War II. Mm -hmm. And if you go back before World War II, it's really the same three anyway. The NDP was known by a different name, the CCF. Uh, you guys in Quebec seem <laughs> to come up with new parties and new, you know, new representation and there's this English rights party that's there and then gone and social credit is there and then gone and, uh, you know, why? Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's still, I mean, I would say, uh just to nuance that, that Quebec has had a stable two-party system. It's just the two parties keep on changing, right? Okay. So that's the, the difference. The Liberal Party has managed to survive over the decades, mm -hmm. century, um, but it's really the other party that comes up that has changed. So from the Union Nationale, the Parti Québécois, and then these third parties that rise and fall just about as quickly. So the English lang uh, Language Rights Party, Egalité Québec, was one of those. The ADQ, which is basically no longer a spent political force mm -hmm. uh, in Quebec. We are, I guess, about 15 and a half year, 15 years, 15 years roughly since the last referendum. Mm -hmm. Is Quebec more animated today by the left-right political s dynamic or the separatist federalist dynamic? I think they're both in play, even though the latter, the separatist federalism, is very much on the back burner. It's still there. It's still animating uh, partisan sentiment. It's still animating political debate. But Quebec has, for the past few years, been very focused on what its economic future is. And a few years ago, we had a debate between a group of uh, proto-liberal, uh, uh, sort of more economic liberal types who were saying that Quebec needed to move beyond the state. These were the lucid people who were looking at things clearly and lucidly, people like former Premier uh, Lucien Bouchard, people uh, like Joseph Facal, the former PQ cabinet minister, people who thought that Quebec needed to move beyond its quiet revolution, state-led kind of uh, idea of progress. And they came face to face with another group called uh, the, the, the Solidaire, the people who thought that Quebec's success, economically and socially speaking, was because of this unique model that it's fashioned in where you have strong social programs, a strong bond between state and society. So that is, I think, the crucial kind of debate that we're having. What's interesting about Quebec is that we're having it out in the open. I mean, this is like a very animated debate. People get worked up about where they are in terms of the future of Quebec in newspapers, on TV. So it is, in, in effect, uh, I think a really interesting way of debating the future through these two lenses. So if you were a political science professor at a major university in Quebec, you'd think this was a pretty cool time. It is. I mean, so every, all interesting times are cool for, yeah. for political science professors, but certainly in Quebec, we are, I think, at a turning point in terms of the future. And Jean Charest's government uh, was supposed to lead us into that turning point. It just hasn't gotten us there yet. In which case, who is the most credible, influential political figure in Quebec today? Honestly, mm -hmm. Gilles Duceppe. I thought you were going to say that. Isn't that weird? <laughs> and he spends half his time in Ottawa. Yes, he does. Well, I mean, he's also on the other side in Gatineau. But 
<laughs> true <laughs> enough, so. true enough. Uh, how come? Well, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the personal qualities of the man. Uh, Gilles Duceppe, I think, is, uh, and I say this in a completely nonpartisan way, one of the most authentic politicians you will ever come across. He is someone that when he speaks, you really think he is speaking the truth, that he is talking to you and not, you know, couching anything in airy-fairy discourse or making a meal out of it. Mm -hmm. He is actually just speaking what he believes to be the truth in a very direct and forward way. He is a very, very good politician. He is a man who can command a room, he can command a party. So I think on, on those kinds of strengths as a leader, he certainly is out there. But also he speaks to Quebecers in a way that's very clear and straightforward. I mean, look, he's going to Ottawa to defend Quebec's interests. That's, that's a pretty easy road to hoe if pretty that's simple. all you have to do day yeah. after day. And Quebecers are confident that that's what he's doing for them. Otherwise, how would a party that has no hope ever of getting into power in Ottawa, continue to receive so much support from Quebec voters. I don't think Quebec voters are stupid. I don't think Quebec voters kind of have written off Canada as a whole. I think they really do believe that Gilles Duceppe and the Bloc Québécois are doing what it takes to get their voice heard in Ottawa. Well, Woody Allen used to say 90% of life is just showing up. I mean, and he's been just showing up for quite Absolutely. a long time, hasn't he? He's our elder statesman in Canadian politics. Think about that it. That is a bit odd, isn't that it? Is. Well, what he decides to do or not to do in the next, I don't know what, six months to mm -hmm. a year, could have significant ripples both provincially and federally, right? Can you just explain how that dynamic's working itself out now? Hugely. Uh, the first question is whether he'll stay at the helm of the Bloc Québécois, because if he doesn't, that's a party that is uh, going to go through a leadership review and a leadership crisis, because again, there's no heir apparent in that party either. Uh, but the second thing is that his future is also um, tied up in the fortunes of the Parti Québécois, because many people are saying, if now there's a room for the Parti Québécois to grow its base, we need a leader that's more effective than Pauline Marois. Who would the natural successor be? And a lot of people are pointing to Gilles Duzep. Hmm. Would it be good for, I shouldn't say good, what impact would it have on the national scene? Because of course, all of the speculation is about whether there's gonna be an election after the budget in the spring. As people are trying to read the tea leaves here, if he were to leave Ottawa and go provincial if that avenue is open to him. You know, what's the impact on how the seats start to fall in Quebec in the federal election? Yeah, so that's, that's a big crystal ball you're sure. looking into. Um, and he has, I think, I think he has one more federal election in him uh, at the head of the Bloc Québécois. But were he to make the move out of that leadership position, uh, that would be hugely important in terms of the Bloc's fortunes in the short term, as they get over their leadership review. But remember, the Bloc Québécois is a, you know, an old party in many ways in Ottawa. It's been there since 1993. It's not an organization that has, you know, that could disappear overnight like the ADQ. This is a party that has roots. It has an organization. It has a standing uh, in Ottawa. It knows the ropes really well. But in that time, it's also mm -hmm. had two, you know, remarkably charismatic leaders who people know. That's Everybody right. knows across the country. So if Duceppe yeah. left, Gilles Duceppe was known mo mostly in Quebec before uh, he became leader of the, the Bloc Québécois, and he grew his persona to be a Canadian one after that. So I think that if the Bloc Québécois was able to do that, uh, then they would be able maybe to match uh, Gilles Duceppe, but it would, it's not clear to me who it would be, certainly not in the formation right now, in, in, the, in the bench or the caucus of the, of the Bloc Québécois and which it takes a lot of guts for a Quebec politician to make the leap to Ottawa. Mm -hmm. But does it, do, do you think it has uh, Stephen Harper and Michael Ignati of Jack Layton salivating in the back rooms thinking, please go, they'll have a no-name leader in their place, and that puts in play a whole bunch of seats in Quebec that otherwise wouldn't be in play? I think they shouldn't salivate over it too much because the Bloc Québécois is still symbolizes something that's important for Quebecers, which is a voice for Quebec that is strong, and that is listened to in the sense of being this block, right, a mm -hmm. voice from Quebec. So I think the South Asian should be a little <laughs> moderated. And also to remember that a lot of seats in Quebec are four-way races, right? Hmm. They're three-way and four-way races in which you really don't know what the outcome is going to be until you get on the ground. Okay, in which case, obviously the, the Bloc Québécois is, the, is choice number one, has been for a long time in Quebec right now. Who's choice number two? Well, that's an interesting question because it doesn't look like there is a choice number two. In many ways, it kind of depends where you're talking about. Quebec's uh, politics, just as they are in Ontario, are very regionalized, right? So it's hard to be uh, general, to generalize about where the Quebec body politic is going. Certainly in Montreal, the Liberal Party is still a viable force. It's a viable force in the west part of the island, and it has some very strong seats. 
uh, whether or not it can actually gain the terrain that it's lost outside of the island of Montreal is very much up for question. And then there's Quebec City, which is really the loose cannon of Quebec mm -hmm. politics, right? The maverick of Quebec politics, where you have now the Conservatives that are grounded in that area. But again, that with strong candidates from other parties could be up for grabs. And the NDP hanging on to that one seat in Outremont. And is that safe, that seat? Well, uh, I live in Outremont, so I would okay. say well, that um, yeah. Tom Mulcair is, is a politician with a lot of uh, persona. And also, he, has a, he is there. He is someone who is, I think, a good example of what an MP should be, present on the ground, engaged, and all of that. All of that, though, uh, means nothing if the Bloc Québécois decides to field a star candidate in that riding, right? Or if the Liberals decide to do that as well. So I think that the Outremont is a good seat for the NDP to have. I don't know if it's as safe as the NDP might think. And I don't know if there are any other seats that are out there where the NDP could get support in Quebec because the NDP support is diffuse. Hmm. Antonia, 30 seconds left. Is Quebec politics as interesting now as you've ever seen it? I think it is. I mean, I think it's interesting in a different way than it was when it was cataclysmic about uh, the referendum in the 1990s or about where we're going in the early 2000s. I think now it is really about Quebec's future. Uh, Quebec's future as an entity, as a polity. Uh, so what's it going to do about its economy? What's it going to do about its society? But also its future within Canada, which I don't think that debate is over yet. Oh, well, for sure. Uh, always good of you to join us here uh, at TVO. Appreciate your time so much. Antoni Maioni, Director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.